I've been asked today to give a speech on the theme of the father, the mentor, the architect, and the engineer. And we're going to concentrate on the father. That's the theme of the weekend. But you'll see later how this unfolds. I'm going to take you through something from the philosophical world, which is called dialectics. We're going to take a dialectical approach to the word father. Dialectic starts with the negation. It starts with something that's lacking. Whatever is then lacking is filled with some kind of content that's kind of vague. We don't really know what it is yet. It's called an abstraction. And eventually, the abstraction unfolds into something concrete, a concretion. So we're going to do that. For example, let's do with something you guys, most of you guys like. Well, all of you guys like. Some of you, some of you, you guys like to fuck it, like 95% of you. The other 5% of you like to dress it. It's called woman. Okay, so woman is an abstraction. <laughs> well, woman is a negation in this case. Woman is a negation. Something we haven't filled with anything yet. You haven't put your penis into it. Nothing has happened to it. It's just something beautiful and stunning and other side of the river and unreachable to you guys. Okay, it's a woman, right? Then you manage to get your penis inside of it. Something happens with you. Something gets out of your body and suddenly woman becomes mother. <laughs> Pregnant woman. <laughs> <laughs> pregnant woman is mother as abstraction. When you think of a pregnant woman, especially if you happen to be the guy who impregnated her, you think of that as a mother. But it's a mother in future, right? There's something happening inside of her, her womb is growing and all that. That's a perfect example of something in abstraction. It's a woman in, in mother in abstraction. And then she gives birth to a baby one day and suddenly you realize that you're losing out on the game because the baby gets her intention instead of you. The next year is terrible sex life and getting woken up in the middle of the night and all that. Because you're in a game here where you're a loser. You're a man. So um, then she becomes mother concretion. Okay, that's how dialectics work. That's how actually how an intelligent mind operates. It looks at the words dialectically. That's how we use these terms. Now let's look at the word father. Okay, sounds like a great word. Father here. Yeah. We talk about fathers this weekend, and fathers are something to be proud of, some kind of man, right? So what is a father, then? Well, I can make sort of a, an amateur survey of 24-year-old men who attend men's work events in Europe in the spring 2020. Okay, what would they report back? 95% of them will report back that they have no idea what a father is, but the guess it's something like a mother without tits. <laughs> That's what a 24-year-old average man today thinks. Okay, it's not, okay? You haven't even begun to ask the question, what is a father? You haven't even studied it. You haven't even gotten out there on your own journey to try to explore what a father is. You have the wrong assumption of what a father is. Definitely the wrong one. And I see this all the time when guys are asked about the fathers and, you know, how terrible their childhood was and the fathers weren't present. Hey, second, mothers are present, fathers are not. My father was absent. He's supposed to be absent. He's supposed to go to work every day and get shit done. A father is a character who's supposed to be out there in the world to protect for you, to provide for you and your mother and her greedy little, you know, shoe interests, and pray for you. That's what absent fathers are supposed to do. Protect for you, provide for you, and pray for you. Meaning they talk to what's higher than them. That's praying to the gods. They provide for you, meaning they get all the resources in. And it's the second you discover as a baby that that breast full of milk isn't just magically filled with milk. It's filled with milk because somebody else gets the shit out there, works really hard, and feeds that female body so there is breast in the milk that you can then yum into your mouth. Okay? So, that's what fathers are, essentially. They're supposed to be absent. Let's start there. Um, now, how do we get to that? Well, we start with ourselves. So, mother can here be a negation. Start with mother. It's negation. Uh, pregnant woman, where did your life start? Your life starts nine months inside a morphine tent. You began as a slacker. And a slacker who got everything you ever wanted. You could just press the button, it was there. Press the button, it was there. Actually, there was even not a button, there was a cord. There's a cord between the embryo and the female body, and actually everything is fed to you at all times. Most 24-year-old men still want to be like that. That's what we call them slackers. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to quit that after your first nine months. But that's how we start life. So we start life in paradise, completely united with the female body. Is there any difference here between the baby and the mother? No, none at all. Not in the mother's mind and not in your mind at all. 
Then something incredibly traumatic happens, and I've got good news for you. Whatever you go through in your life that is absolutely horrible, you've been through the worst already. It's called birth. Okay? You were for nine months in a morphine tent, and you were then squeezed out the very way your father came in. Squeezed out with your full baby body. Tortured. Tortured to be born. Screaming, of course, when you get out, right? Thank God you can't remember that. That's the great thing we do traumatology. You just wish your patients can't remember the trauma at all. Because there's no point in staying there, that's for sure. And thankfully, nature at least has been kind enough to us not to remember our birth. Why is that? The birth is for the mother. Because it's the mother who realizes after birth that mother and child are separate units. What does the child do? The first thing the child does, well, this, this is where culture comes in for the first time. The first thing you see in your life when you get out, hopefully, is not your mother's face, whether you like it or not, because otherwise you would be truly incestuous and want to fuck your mother. No, you see a midwife. You see an older woman who smiles at you and says, welcome to the world, mister, and you get out. What she then does, this is culture, she cuts the cord. That's the beginning of culture, when culture interferes with nature, because otherwise you die because there'd be infections in the cord. So we are actually cultural beings from the very beginning. Somebody cuts the cord, and the first thing you do after the cord is cut is that you crawl to where? The tick. It's called instinct. Why do you crawl to the tick? You don't want to be out there in the world you're terrified of, it. You don't want to be in the world at all. You want to be back in the womb. Back in the womb. And the only way to get back into the womb, because you can't, your father's supposed to get back in there, you're not is that you crawl to the tick, you hang onto the tick, you suck the tick as much as you like and get milk out of it. And you're unified with the world again, you're back in the womb. So it's not like you're being separated from the mother at birth, it's her separation from you that starts there. And it's very, very hard for women to separate themselves from children. Actually, they can't. Unless the child or the father does the job for them, they won't. They'll stick with you forever. They're totally addicted to you. He's like, baby me, separate the outcast, okay, have a minute, but it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. All right? So you stick to the tit, mother and baby together. Yeah, it's Virgin Mary and Jesus child, all these images, right? And, and that's where we stay during the first year. But sometime during the first year of your life, at some point, the motherly body, or the motherly part of this unified body, walks out of the room, and there's something left in the room that starts screaming because it realizes something is left in the room that isn't mother. That's your first experience of self. Abstraction. And it's a terrible horror. Non-mother. <laughs> That's your beginning of your ego, your own self. Non-mother. There's something that isn't mother. Non-mother. That's your birth. That's your first sense of separation from mother, and it's horrible. There's nothing nice about that at all. It's a void. There's nothing there. You will spend the rest of your life chasing some kind of content to throw into that void, and you will always fail, and then you die. That's life. That's why, that's why all these guys who talk about ego death and go to Bali, I always tell them that. I've never seen so many fucking narcissists I see in Bali all the time. They're all full of their own egos. Because they don't understand that ego is a void. And the more you think about it, the more you try to get it, the bigger it gets. Until you've got nothing else in your head than your own ego, and that's narcissism, right? Not a good idea. Bali's full of these ugly people. So there you go. Self, negation here. The negation process here for mother and self is that self is non-mother. So self is non-mother. It essentially is. You still keep sucking the tit. Then something happens at almost exactly one year of age. Uh, a physician, a doctor, a medical doctor, would say that you get teeth in your mouth, and therefore it's no longer nice to suck the tit. A psychologist would say, there's something that's awakening you suddenly that wants to be more independent because you want to crawl around, you don't want to be a toddler anymore, you want to crawl around or start walking and everything. So you want to get away from the female body. Psychologists would say that that's happens at one year of age. A psychoanalyst would be much more brutal and said, a guy, something else that isn't mother, walks by with a big penis swinging around. And mother is looking in that direction. And she's not looking at you. It's called the Oedipus complex in boys because you want to have that penis. It's called the Electra complex in girls because they want to have it inside of them. But the girl is too small to have it inside of her, this big penis. And you're way too small with your tiny little boy dick to be anything like that that just walked by. You're nothing. That's father. Non-mother, non-self. This is where father comes in. 
Before this happens, there's no point in fathers at all. But you know what's really scary with our society today? Is that from this point on, father is way more important than mother. And that's where we totally fucked it up in our society. This is called the phallic intrusion in any religion. That's why fathers should fight to have at least half the custody of the children when there's a divorce battle. If the children are over one year of age, use this argument. Yeah, mother was important. But the separation from mother is absolute key. And the only way for the child to imagine something different than the mother's sphere is to imagine that there's a father's sphere that you can't have access to. Do you see how, how important it is that the father is absent? Because the mother is present. So childhood is this journey between the absolute nurturing of absolute, total, unconditional love of the mother. The mother will always give you a gold star. She will always say you're perfect. She will always tell you you're the king of the world. She will always tell you you're Napoleon, Messiah, whatever you want. There can be nothing more important in the world than you. Oh, mother says that I'm perfect. Yeah, all mothers do, unfortunately. And when you see other kids, you realize they've all been fooled into the same game. That's what mothers do. They can't stop themselves from loving you endlessly, infinitely, unconditionally, right? The father, though, he's over here. He's fucking your mom. He's doing all kinds of things that you don't get access to, you don't do, including being the fucking grown-up who goes to work. He has careers. He's busy. He's out in the world. He's doing tons of things. So you get attracted to him. You want to be like him. You read superhero comic books about super fathers. You're obsessed with it. You want to have the big penis, you want to be like him, you want to be grown up, you want to have the muscles, you want to be like big body over there. And he's free, and you're not. Because you're tied to the tit for support. You can't work, you can't make your living on your own. You cannot provide for yourself. You cannot protect yourself, and you can certainly not pray for yourself because you have no credibility with any gods or major powers out there in the world. But your father is out there in the world. That's what a father is. That's what a father is. Starting from one year of age. And you aspire to him. It's programmatic. It's just, it's, just, it's just the first thing you do. You want to be like him. You want to be at least one of them. Here's where we come into the next word, mentor. Another big mistake in our culture is that a very cynical and sort of autistic Prussian bureaucrat in 1813 invented a concept called the nuclear family. <laughs> Have you heard of that? Okay, it only exists in our culture. It's never existed before historically in any culture at all. It's considered absolutely absurd among the Chinese and the Indians and the Africans and any other culture you talk to, including Martians. It's like the most stupid idea ever. Imagine it's a Prussian autist in Ben States. Why? For economical reasons. Why? Just like any guy who works at an ad agency today in 2020, he wants to make money and he wants to be efficient. And he just realizes that if he split up all the beautiful little villages of northern Germany, and just split them up and have one man, one woman, one child, realize it's autistic, right? One man, woman, one or two children here in a farm, and that farm is separated from the rest of the village. We have nuclear family, and they're frustrated, but they're more economically efficient so we can increase farm produce in Prussia. Nuclear family is a terrible idea. There is no one father. There are fathers. And any good father, the first thing he will teach you is that I'm not a singular, I'm a pluralist. There are many of me. And as soon as you possibly can, when I'm not the one you can reflect yourself in, because you're probably quite different from me, you might even be a different archetype from your father. You might even be more like your mother than you're like him, although you have a penis. Then it's great for you to know there are fathers. Any healthy man I meet has always grown up with the plurality of fathers around him. Not just that one father was great and present and there all the time and taking him with it and going with him to kindergarten. I mean, for God's sake, your father is not your best friend. Not at all. A good father tells you, I'm your father, I'm not your best friend. Go and get best friends. You need to fix that yourself. That's like the first thing a father should tell you. Because best friends are supposed to be five when you're five, not 42. If your father stays around with you to be your best friend, that's a really bad omen. If your father pretends he's your mother, bad omen. Get out of that. Father is way too important to just be mother 2.0. So we get out of that, one year of age, this starts happening. There's a world out there to uncover. So this is father here, non-self-father, right? We can then take this father off in three different directions. We have three beautiful absent fathers here. I told you one of them protects the community. Not you, 
Not even you and mom, not even you, mom and siblings, but community. He's got a much bigger job than just protecting you and your little ego. Okay, he's called the warrior. Then we've got another father who's out there in the world, way out in the world. He's flying and traveling and going everywhere. And he's trading and he's bringing in prosperity, he's providing for the community. We call him the merchant. And hey, there's a last father here, the father of the fathers. The father is even called the father if you go to a Catholic church. We've got Michael over there is one of them. They call priests. Oh, the priest is not for you? No, the priest is not there for you to confess to. The least thing a priest wants is his own child in the confession booth. Number one, because he doesn't want any part in your life at all. He wants you to go to another priest if you need to confess to somebody. And number two, he's sick and tired of confessions. Priests have people coming into the confession booths all day long, babbling, 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 and babbling, babbling about their old boring lives. And you know what the boring thing is of being a priest? All human beings think they're unique, but they're all the same, especially boys. <laughs> they're all the same. Okay, these guys are absent fathers. Tomorrow we're going to have a ceremony called the Blessing of the Fathers. We're going to celebrate the absent fathers. Il over there is going to be warrior caste father. I'm here. I'm going to be merchant caste father. And Michael over there is going to be priestly caste father. That means Eli symbolizes body. I symbolize mind. And Michael symbolizes spirit. And I'm going to give you a really good female shit test on if you have any collective intelligence at all in this crowd. I'm going to make you try to figure out how a third of you are going to go for Michael, and a third of you are going to go for me, and a third of you are going to go for Eli. And I'll give you a little tip. If you go to the shortest queue, you get more time with us and have more narcissism. So that's okay. It's just a calculation, keep in mind. It means if you don't care which caste you belong to, pick the shortest cue. So, you know, that's collective intelligence for you. So then we're going to do that tomorrow. So we're going to celebrate Father, in, at least I propose as a merchant. Remember, I travel more than the priests do. I travel more than the warriors do. I'm out in the world all the time. And I might even think that, you know, a, a whorehouse next to Shanghai Airport is more interesting than my nuclear family at the moment. You know, it's, I'm, I'm a merchant, right? But I'm providing, I'm providing, I'm bringing in the goods. <laughs> Oh, God, I'm the father who gives you tons of gifts when I've been out traveling, because the longer I'm away from my son, the more gifts I get. And all the gifts are guns and steel and shit. And so I want to turn him into a proper man so he can be merchant like me. Okay? So say you got, for example, medical doctor inclination. You want to be caretaker. That's the kind of father you want to be, not just to family kids. You want to take care of others. And you have that calling, go for Michael. That's priestly caste. You can ask us later if you want to sort of divide this. Warrior caste, or... you say you, you're one of these guys who can't stop building. And the first day on your vacation, you do the lawn, and then you start building a new veranda because your wife needs it, even if she doesn't ask for it yet. That's definitely warrior caste. That whole engineering mentality is warrior caste, right? And if you're like me, like you just like traveling all around, and you drank too much with the other pals when you were younger, but finally you got married to nail yourself somewhere on the map and have a wife, and you compensate richly for it by bringing in the goods. I mean, I'm the guy who has the fat back account and lots of stock that you can inherit. That's merchant cast. So you got these three categories. And when you think of it, that's what fathers are. That's what fathers are when they're brilliant in their absence. To provide, to protect, and to pray for you. So we have that order for tomorrow. You got that set here. OK, let's go back here, what father does to you. <clears throat> what you do from one year of age is that you mimic. And you should. The problem with contemporary society is everybody mimics all the time. That means they also mimic terror. They mimic angst. They mimic when they're scared. And that's where we're going into an era of lynch mobs. I know some of you are familiar with the intellectual deep web and other stuff. You know, long, a lot of the younger guys here are members of those fora. And we're talking a lot about Rene Girard's work right now and where technology is going next. And we're seeing that lynch mobs are becoming a huge problem in, in culture today. That's because there's no idea of the vision of the future there. It's a lack of phallus. I tell you one thing. Vision and strategy is as masculine as giving birth is feminine. If you walk into a vision and strategy room, Regardless of which caste you belong to, you will always find men and the occasional lesbian in that room. That's it. It's incredibly masculine. 
That's also why you take a woman for a date. You've got to have the plan on where you're going on that date. You've got to have a plan for your life. You've got a plan where you're going next that she can then say yes or no to or say maybe, but then you have to alter it, right? So women love to present it with a vision and strategy. They don't do that. They don't do vision and strategy. There's no vision and strategy in birth to a child or feeding it at all. None whatsoever. There's no vision and strategy in caring for your baby. But there's tons of vision and strategy in pulling your society forward and pulling yourself forward and pulling a possible family of the future forward or developing new technology going forward. So here's the father here. Now, this father has been under attack in our culture. We are ourselves to blame. We are ourselves to blame. We went into colonization of the entire planet and exploited it heavily and destroyed most of it. And um, it caught up with us. It's called climate change today. Um, we also went to war with other cultures and plotted them. It's called colonization. We still suffer from the consequences of that behavior because we weren't, we weren't going to the fathers. We weren't going to the priests and get for direction. We just went out there in the world and plundered. These are bad merchants, bad warriors, and bad priests, right? We did that. We did that from Europe, the rest of the world. Eventually, it all collapsed into two world wars. And those two world wars meant that 130 million people in Europe died. 110 of those 130 million people who died were young men. We killed our own sons in our culture. And we still suffer from the consequences, because if you look at what we call the West, after 1945 forward, when people think of patriarchs, the most beautiful word ever, the father of the fathers, they think of Hitler and Stalin and colonial empires to plunder the planet. We did bad. We separated church and state in our culture, and I think that was a terrible mistake. So the state could run off and plunder the planet, which is bad masculinity. That's the real toxic masculinity. We still live in the consequence of that. But the problem is after 1945 was that a certain feminine power that needed to be protected, that needed to be provided for, that needed to be prayed for, had to go out on its own. And women started trusting governments and institutions and systems around them to be what fathers were supposed to be. It's called feminism. It makes perfect sense when you see it as a starting point from a void, a lack of something, the negation, the lack of phallus. The lack of phallus created the idea that you could replace the phallus with all kinds of other things. It's called intersectionality these days, and it doesn't work. And it's causing havoc in our society. And it's a tragedy of our times. And this tragedy started in 1945. And with the internet accounts everywhere, with everybody's weathering their angst, right out in the open, it's now moving into a chaos where the consequences we're paying right now is that in the last 10 years, at least in Scandinavia in the last 10 years, the number of young men who seek psychiatric care for acute depression and acute bipolarity has quadrupled. This is why the reaction for 23-year-olds are like me and they're like Jordan Peterson. When they see somebody out there who speaks about this, they go instantly for it because they need mentors to guide them through life. And I've got like lists of thousands of guys who are looking for fathers asking me to be their mentor. This is where the absolute need is right now. We need more fathers. Thousands of more fathers. Mentors, 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 mentors who can guide young men into becoming warriors, merchants, and priests and eventually biological fathers too. That's the mess we're in. Father is lacking. We call this the, the absence of the phallus, and that is a terrible thing for any society to have. That's a rat right now. The absence of vision and the absence of a strategy tied to that vision. Do you hear anybody today speak about the future any longer? No, don't hear that at all. You hear politicians speak about the future? No, they just sound like they're robots who are trained by communication agencies to be cynical, don't they? Mostly they're women and gay guys, because straight guys don't even qualify as politicians any longer. They don't, have any, they don't have the credentials for it. Whenever the gay guys and the women have to take over, we have failed. Because they're good at hairdressing in shoes and looking great and making us look great, you know? Don't ever let heterosexual people do fashion design for any gender, never. <laughs> Never, never. I'm a big fan of gay rights, provocatively, rightfully so, right? What they're good at. So the, all these things that are happening around us are signals that phallus is lacking. We're all here talking about the father because fathers are lacking. But it's not about you 
having an absent father who you're dealing with because he failed. Yes, maybe he was a boy who competed for your mother's attention. That is called reverse Oedipus complex, and it's terrible. And it takes years to unwind to get out of. But the reason why it's full of that is because your father didn't have a father because that father died in a battlefield somewhere in Europe in 1943. That's what most cultures in Europe are lacking. That's where, that's where the lack is. So we still have to repay that. We're still in that mode. We have to resurrect the father, resurrect the phallus, which is vision. And with vision, and only with vision can we have a strategy forward into the future. Here are the good news. And this is a gift from the gods for all men. Sometimes we're just lucky. Sometimes you're born with the most hopeless father in the world, but there happened to be another guy who became your mother's lover just about the time you were born, and he was the most beautiful stepfather you could ever have, and that's the ultimate father. You know, sometimes we're lucky. Sometimes we're all lucky. You see, about 4,000 years ago, a Persian philosopher called Zoroaster, I love this guy a lot, realized that everything in human history up to that point had been an eternal recurrence of the same. Everything is the same. This is the female universe. Like, yeah, it's New Year to this year. That means it's a new year. It's a new world. But it's all the same world as last year. That's the women remember everybody's birthday. And they like the Christmas to be everything like it was last year's Christmas. Because if you're a woman, you're a daughter, all you need to do is to mimic your mom all the way through into adulthood. So you don't only mimic her as a girl. You can mimic her as a woman, too, because giving birth is the same thing all the time. That's a beauty of womanhood. To get away with this, we call it nomadology. It's the idea that everything returns to the same. Hinduism, for example, is a very feminine religion. It's the, it's the circularity of everything returning to the same point all the time. But 4,000 years ago, a guy called Sorastor had discovered that we could write. And that had consequences. Because with the capacity to write, we can store information outside of our own brains. Before that, the amount of information available to any tribal community in the world was constant over time. As soon as an old person died, the whole library died, because everything was memorized. Now you could store information, so you could interview old Helga before she died, get all the information out of her head, get it into a notebook like Pontus is doing right there. And by storing information there, there's more information available than inside Pontus' brain, so he's smarter than the rest of us. Anybody with a notebook is smarter than the guy without a notebook. So Raster discovered this 4,000 years ago, and he then realized that means that this circle of everything returning to the same, everything being the same all the time, every new year is a new year. Yeah, and we die, but then we live again. It's just resurrections and reincarnations and coming back and going forward all the time, and nothing ever happens. This is the female universe. You know women are like that? Like, they don't like that. If you date a woman, this is how our mind works. Allow it, it's true. It's we are our stupid in dream. That's what boys do. So, but for us to discover that, yeah, but if on one of these turns, if we started this turn carefully, if we start to store information outside of our own heads, there's a slight abbreviation here when you get here. A slight, slight, slight difference with every turn of events. Because there's more information next year than there was the year before. And this creates a hopeless little dream that was implanted into male minds ever since. The son's world can be proved on compared to the father's. It doesn't have to be repeated. And this is where mimicking stops. Yeah, you still do 99% of your life mimicking. You mimic all the time. You mimic your professions. You mimic your masters. You mimic your mentors. You mimic everybody. You mimic your neighbor. And you might even fight over the same woman with your neighbor called your own wife. You know, you have all kinds of struggle with mimicking all the time. It's terrible. It's the worst part of the humanity. But as a man, you have an opportunity that women don't have. You can look at the world differently than your father did by knowing that there's more information available to you. There's a name for that. That name is technology. We're innovators of technology. Technology to men is a babysitter to women. It's our envy of the woman's capacity to give birth to a child. That means that we think our phallus can give birth to what? Technology. 
That's the name for it. And here's where the good news comes in, that you guys don't deserve and I don't deserve it, but we're really, really lucky. Precisely when radical feminists are declaring that the patriarchy is over, it's going to return with a vengeance. And that's not yours. That's not because of you. It's just pure luck. Because technology is currently taking over the world. I call this technological patriarchy. It's going to arrive in a massive way over the next 10 years. The coronavirus pandemic is the first example. Because for the first time in 60 years, we're going to see mass female unemployment in our economies, not male. For every three girls who are fired in a classic shop, they're replaced with three guys who work in a logistics center in an e-commerce company. Male employment is going up. Female employment for the first time going down. And because female unemployment, female employment is so radically dependent on state, on the state. It's all state, government, state sector jobs. That means if the state gets smaller from now on, that means there will be increased and increased female unemployment. You're going to have a lot of very bitter 35-year-old radical feminists around 10 years from now. This is just the beginning of that disappointment, because the matriarchs are lacking, the older women who guide young women are lacking. They're all sitting on their Instagram accounts and they're yelling at everything they can see and think they're powerful, and they get high on it. That's how young women are today. They have eating disorders and they have burnouts because of it. You get the depressions and you get the bipolarity pandemics instead. These are all healthy reactions against a very unhealthy system. The system is completely shifted in the wrong way because of a lack of phallus. There's no dick anywhere in our society. Look at the advertisements for the British or American army in 2020. It's like a bunch of peaceniks going on a vegan cuisine picnic. That's not an army. You're killing the army. And any young man knows that. They know this is fucked up. This is not an army. This is not where I'm supposed to go as, an, as a warrior. And they say, capitalism is bad. We need to get rid of capitalism. We need to move everything over to the state and then distribute it so everybody gets equality of outcome. No, I'm a merchant. I want to trade. I want to go into the bazaar and I want to show my goods. And I want to beat the other guy with a better product at a lower price. And women take care of us. Yes, they do. You want a woman when you enter life. Matrical gaze. Midwife's base meets you. You want a woman next to you when you die. You want women around you when you die. I've got a niece who does that beautifully. But in between that, you want to be a man. And if you're a priest, you're not a nanny. You are the phallic gaze. You're not your mother. The priestly gaze looks at you, but first it looks at reality. It looks at reality, then it looks at you, and it tells you exactly what your chances are to improve on yourself and get through with life. And it kills your dreams, and it kills your narcissism, and it squeezes you back into the box where you belong to tell you, this is what you're supposed to do to be a father. We're longing for it. This is our chance. Technology is our chance. 93% of the world's tech entrepreneurs today are men. These are the good young men. These are the young men who do not get depression, who do not get bipolar disease. These are the guys I gamble on. This is the new elite. And tell you what, the 7% of tech entrepreneurships that are run by women are usually crap. Because they're usually about collecting plastic bags to look good to other women. It's called charity events and lamp shops. It's what always women do when they fail. When they try to be men and they're not. You know. Because they think running a company is looking good to the other girls and having high shoes. The reality running a company is the most difficult thing in the world. You need to make a profit to begin with. So this is the return of fallacy. We've got a unique chance to do it. But if we fail here, if we allow technology to be Instagram, if we allow technology to be fake photographs, if we allow technology to be rotten ads thrown in our faces all the time, if we allow technology to be spam and other kinds, if you allow technology to become time pass industry, the most evil thing ever, time pass, it is literally what it says. The time pass industry in Silicon Valley creates games that addict young men to play games that are totally isolated, atomistic, and totally stupid, and they learn nothing from them. Just to kill time. The internet today is evil, inhumane, non phallic, created by boys, not by men. We have a unique chance to restore fatherhood and mentorhood, and it's called technology. And please observe me here. These are also great metaphors, as always with dialectics, to go in the opposite direction. Now think of yourself as a father. 
as a biological father, and if you don't want children, like me, as a mentor. I'm an uncle, godfather, everything like that. You have no idea how many kids I have by now. So we all have kids eventually. We all become fathers and mentors. Every one of us is going to become a father and a mentor. Now, if you want to prepare yourself for that, these are great metaphors. These are great ways for you to introduce yourself to your relationship towards technology when technology takes over the world and men are going around the world again and must do so responsibly. My idea here is to actually create a religion of technology rather than a religion of magic. Because if you can contain technology, religion is containing something as to operate in the right direction without getting the wrong way. That's what religion is. If you go to the confession booth, it's not about admitting anything or getting your sense forget. It's really about getting a redirection of your force, your phallic force, so you go in the right direction, make the right decisions, and then complement. Okay? We got a unique chance to restore fatherhood and mentor. But look at it the other way also. The architect in you is the guy who takes charge of his own life and starts planning for raising a family. Take control of that right away. I have so many women who come up to me and say, I am sick of dating guys who come to me and ask me what I want in my life. What do they care? I want shoes and a dog. That's what girls want, and babies. That's what they want. That's big, they do half the job anyway. They don't have to do anything else. We don't have any heritage. We don't survive. There's nothing beyond our death unless we have children. They get half the deal, and they deliver on that. Their nature, that's already secured. We must be cultured. That's what it means to be a man. So what do you do then if you're cultured and go on a date with a woman? You have a plan. You have a plan for yourself. You know who you are. You know what kind of archetype you are. You've got a mentor who points you in the right direction. You hopefully had a good father to begin with who gave you fathers and told you, I'm not the only one. Here are my friends. You know what? Fathers who go to kindergartens with their kids are fucked up. Fathers who take their kids with them to work are great fathers. It was the most wonderful time to my childhood when my, my, my dad took me into work and I got to see his colleagues and how they worked and the stuff they did. I, I want to be like him when I grow up. That's what fathers do. They take their kids with them out to the world where they're in. Not that they combine themselves with the women in the kindergarten and sit around there and play with the kids. That's what fathers do. Now, you get a unique chance to do this because if you plan your life, if you find your architect, no, if you find, sorry, if you find your mentor, if you get a direction in your life, if you discover that you're either a warrior, a merchant, or a priest to begin with, and then some subcategories of that. This is who I am. This is going to be my profession. This is the education I get. This is how I exercise. This is how I take care of myself. And I'm going to go there. And when I'm 30, I'll be this. When I'm 40, I'll be this. When I'm 50, I'll be this. And you go on a date with a girl, and you present your plan. She's going to go, wonderful, finally a man. <laughs> He's got a plan. And I, as a woman, can sit there and say, yes or no to the deal. That's what women do. That's what being a man is. That's where fatherhood starts. It starts with architecture. What a man dreams about, you think about it. You take your dick and your brain and put them together. You dream about standing on a mountain and seeing a valley in front of you, and it's your property. And there's the house there, and the house there, and the guest house there, and there's the lake, and there's the sauna, whatever you got. And you built all this because you didn't do anything else in your vacation, and the lawns are set. And there's a woman there, and she gives birth to three children, and you're fostering these children to conquer the next valley. That's what fathers dream about. That's a father. He's got dreams. Now, if you're that father, you're also the architect. You see how technology rhymes here? There's no difference in building technology from, compared to being a father. They're interchangeable. Then, when you meet the right woman on the right date, and she sits there and smiles at you, and you know her ovaries are just boiling, <laughs> ready to be impregnated, to repeat the whole journey, to fool you into thinking of her as a mother as abstraction. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see this woman with a pregnant belly pumping with life in it? A beautiful daughter, or even better, a son who can take over your empire when you die. Oh, God, 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 you would have put your penis inside of her. And you will, because you pay for the bill. <laughs> and she loves you for it. She marries you. That's the engineer. That's the implementation of your architecture. But don't go on a date thinking you're going to be an engineer without having any plans. Yeah, I'm just a hunk. No, you're a himbo. <laughs> That's okay with gay guys, but not with straight women. <laughs> I'll tell you what, don't do that. Don't be himbo. 
walking through to the date with a plan for your own life and then meet her. And the first thing she will check with you is not the plan itself. The first thing she will check with you before she even listens to you at the date is whether you have tons of male friends who love and respect you. Because a loner will never 